Hello, mysterious person behind the screen, back with another Doc 2 commentary, uh, joined once again by Isaac. Kneel before the might of this commentary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if you haven't guessed, this time we're doing the Pyramids of Mars, or just Pyramids of Mars. Um, so, yeah, I guess, without further ado... If you'd like to sync this up with your own copy of Pyramids of Mars... Put the episode to the start on play all and press play in three, two, one, go. Uh, Pyramids of Mars, the winner of the Doctor Who magazine 40th anniversary poll for the uh, most wanted DVD, wasn't it? It was, yeah. According to the um, DVD. Yep, yeah, according to the back of the DVD. <laughs> yeah, it does not. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me that this one was chosen because it's an insanely popular story. Because I think I think they did a 40th anniversary poll in 2003, mm. and I think this came at number three. And I think Talons was number one, and Caves was number two. Yes. I think Genesis of the Daleks was number four. So, yeah, there was a time where it bet Genesis of the Daleks, but... Now, typically, Genesis seems to take the best story from the 70s spot. Yes. But not surprised. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, I mean, this is still very highly regarded, though. I mean, it's 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 very easy to see why it's such a popular story. It's, um, it's you know, spoilers for the rest it of this is, commentary. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, um, and I think it might be the fourth Doctor story... I'd say along with City of Death as well, that everyone remembers because, mm. you know, you've got like, um, for example, the Green Death in the Pertwee era, it's remembered as the one with the maggots, and this one is probably remembered as the one with the mummies. So yeah. I think, yeah, it's probably the most iconic Fourth Doctor story because it has Sarah Jane in it, Gothic horror, mummies, a really good plot. It's um, scary, violent. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it, it has that dark tone that really typifies a lot of, of this era and especially this season um... mm -hmm. also one thing I noticed is that um, every single supporting character in this story dies that's a good point actually yeah I've never never thought about that that's very true and I think um, Horror Fang Rock is also, another story where every supporting character dies. Yes, yeah. yeah. Not even... Um, I mean, Resurrection of the Daleks does have the highest body count of any Doctor <laughs> Who story, but yeah, every single character who speaks in this or has lines of dialogue, they all die. Yeah, yeah. That's really... It speaks to the tone of the story, doesn't it? It sort of speaks to how mm -hmm. dark it is and how dark it gets. It's a really good model shot. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of Tom Baker, I'm often torn between this story and Horror Fang Rock as his best performance. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this one is is just so. He's got a lot of range yeah, in this. There's so both, much range um, in it. Yeah, and with Pyramids and Fang Rock, they're both quite similar in that the stakes are high, but here the Doctor's very much determined to stop it. Whereas in Horror Fang Rock, he's also determined, but he's very understated, which makes the threat even more scary. Yes. For example, when he says, I've locked, it. I've locked the threat inside with us, you just buy it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this, this scene here... The start of it, that shot of him sort of looking up as the camera sort of pans away and we see the console and everything, that's so iconic. And I like this little bit of introspection from the Doctor and how sort of reflective he is in this bit. Yeah, this is definite. This is probably the most alien the Doctor has been since probably the early Hartnell years. Yeah, I would, yeah... I would imagine so. I mean, because this, this is really very sort of alien and, and out there for 
for this doctor who's usually quite mm-hmm. upbeat and jovial and um and yeah just his opening scene has this he has this aura surrounding him in all this uh and i love that yeah also, um, Sarah Jane is the only woman in this story. Everyone's a man. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But she does get to uh, to wield the gun later on. Oh yeah, she's so... yeah, she's brilliant in this. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, yeah. I mean, if you go to the Graham Williams era, there's so many um, women in that. Mm. Um, heck, they heck a lot of the Graham Williams era villains are women. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's um, very true. Yeah. I can't remember her name. The woman from the Stones of Blood, Queen yeah. Zan- Zania, Zanxia, something yeah, like that. Lady yeah. Adrasta, <laughs> Countess Scarlione. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Heck, I think um, I think there was a statement in the Graham Williams era documentary saying the first year of his era had more women had more roles for women than any of the Flip Hinchcliffe years combined. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's never really. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. You don't really think about that too mm-hmm. often. Though it is directed by a woman, Paddy Russell. That's true, and the direction is brilliant in this. Yeah, she said out of all of them, out of all the four she did, this was her favorite. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to see why. I mean, and I can see why. Just the shot we just saw them with the with the sort of the reflection and stuff and the sort of kind of mirror. It's just, it's brilliantly directed. Really well done. Mm-hmm. Before the eleventh Doctor made Fezzes a fashion <laughs> statement, this guy made them look yeah. really evil. <laughs> The opening also felt very Indiana Jones. Yeah, I, this discovering a um, discovering a tomb and the archaeology and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's it sort of because this one, this story is a part of the season, which obviously uh, harkened back to a lot of old classic horror films, and this this one is definitely very much inspired by the Mummy. Um, mm-hmm, yeah. So it's it's. Yeah, yes. I did a review for this about a year ago, so please check that out. <laughs> yes, go and check out Isaac's review of it for uh, even more thoughts. <laughs> mm-hmm. And even more production history, because obviously this is studio, but when we go to the exterior mm. of the house, um, it was owned by Mick Jagger. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of those odd little facts that you hear, and it's like, wait, that can't be true. But it's like, yep, yeah, it's it's. Well, Tom Baker confirms it in the um, Tom Baker is VHS because he says, yeah. "Yes, I remember that. That was the Pyramids of Mars, and uh, the house we filmed it was owned by Mick Jagger." <laughs> and I know this story for the 50th anniversary. It was chosen. Um, it was part of the uh, watch repeats to represent the fourth Doctor's era, and I can definitely see why. Yeah, this one, um, and I think on the um, on the Sarah Jane Adventures series four or five, um, when they included, I think on... it's four. Yeah, yeah, I think it's series four. This was the one they chose to sort of include as a tribute to Elizabeth Sladen, sir. So... Yeah, definitely. I'm sp- First, they didn't put on the hand of fear instead because it's her last story, but this one's equally as good. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, I yeah, it's interesting they didn't put like the Time Warrior on to, you know, to be her first story, but I think mm-hmm. this just this showcases a lot of what's great about her character in this era. So I think that's probably what motivated it as well. Mhm. Yeah. And this this costume for the fourth Doctor is, um, I'd say it's probably his most iconic of all of his costumes. 
Yeah, his brown one does suit him mm. really well because he had a red one in season twelve as yeah. long, as well as his big outdoor coat. Mm. And um, I think in the actually no, it's the Android Invasion we see next. He's wearing a grey coat. Yeah, that's why he seemed he seemed to alternate between his brown and grey coat because I don't think beyond. Planet of Evil, he wore his red coat again. No, I don't think he did. Um, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I like this one. It suits him, and it, it's, it's probably, it's definitely the most yeah. iconic. Like whenever the Simpsons include the Fourth Doctor, it's always like oh, this yeah. costume. Um, but I really like his grey one as well. I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's the episode Sideshow Bob's Last Gleaming from season seven, where Meg yeah. Ruby says. Bring in the esteemed representatives of television, and the fourth doctor is amongst them. Yeah. <laughs> and there's the um, one of the Treehouse of Horrors also... as well. When um, comic book guy is like a super villain who's collected a load of actors from like TV shows, that, and he's doctor like who? he's like trapped them in in like uh, action figure packaging, and like Tom Baker's just one of them. <laughs> Behold, I am the collector. I need you to add you to my collection. <laughs> Now, interesting about the Fourth Doctor's costume, it was designed by James Ackerson, who yeah. um, went on to win Oscars and even designed the Spider-Man suit for Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. <laughs> he did indeed, and um, I'm yeah, yeah, it's it's such a cool fact, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's just it always kind of blows my mind um, when I when I think of that. I'm just like, yeah, that is. That's a, that's such a cool thing that he designed two two of my favorite things. <laughs> mm -hmm. You could kind of see him look over his shoulder then. I don't know if you saw he was sort of waiting for Tom Baker to put the yeah, scarf over it... him. And you can sort of see him going, is it now? Is it now? <laughs> Interestingly enough, this story was shot, I think, second. But obviously it was shown third because they made this before Planet of Evil. But the reason they swapped them around is for variety. Because you had Terror of the Zygons, which was set on Earth, and they didn't want another story uh, set on Earth to immediately come after it. Uh, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense actually. It's um, yeah, it, it, it you know season thirteen does have a lot of variety in it, and I think the ordering plays quite a big part in that. But um, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, interestingly enough, I think four of the stories are set on Earth. That's Terror of the Zygons, this Android Invasion, and Seeds of Doom. There's only two that where we go to an alien planet, Planet of Evil, and Brain of Morbius. That's true, actually, but it it def it doesn't seem like that just because of the variety of locations that we do see. I think, um, mm -hmm. it's like in this we've got the uh, the whole Egypt thing, and um, in Seas of Doom we get the first two episodes being set in the um, in the base in the base with all the snow and everything. Antarctic. It's uh, the Antarctic, yeah. yeah. Interestingly enough. Um, now the Hinchcliffe era is known for getting complaints from Mary Whitehouse for being too <laughs> scary and too violent, but it did get complaints, particularly Brain of Morbius and Seeds of Doom, from viewers um, saying, you're just ripping off Frankenstein and Day of the Triffids <laughs> I mean, I think that was kind of the intention Yeah, it's, an, uh, it's <laughs> not an... ripping off obviously paying homage yeah, to it Yeah, it's an homage to it um... I mean, it's... it's like what McBain says that's the joke <laughs> <laughs> There used to be a great Twitter account. I'm not sure if it's um, if it still exists or still posts, but it used to be just sort of when on Twitter, it used to quote tweets where people just didn't understand the joke and were being like really stupid, and it just used to oh, quote yeah. quote the tweets with the picture of McBain going, "That's the joke." <laughs> heck, I heck, I used it once when um, a certain Twitter 
Twitter account was being stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and they've now and they've now blocked and they've now and they've now blocked me because I follow another account that likes to take the piss. But um, uh. they're a racist transphobe, so I'm not. So I'm not losing. I've not lost anything. Yeah, no love lost there then. <laughs> yeah. Now those mummies look really good. That now that interesting. Such a cool design. They do, yeah. Plus, also the um, Philip Hinchcliffe was really liked uh, robots because obviously you've got the mummies being robots. Yeah. And I know he didn't produce it, but robot in robot, <laughs> the K one <laughs> robot, and um, uh, yeah, the the robots of death and. Um, Interestingly enough, um, oh, what's his name? Solon was going to be a robot in Brain of Morbius, but he decided against it. Yeah, I think he made the right choice there. Um, it, but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. The robots do recur throughout his era. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This did... And hypnotism as well. Yes, yeah. Because um, the, the fourth Doctor is possessed by Sutek. Elizabeth, uh, Sarah Jane is um, hypnotized by the Doctor in Terror of the Zygons, and um, yeah. uh, what else? Um, Mask of Mandragora, um, Hand of Fear. Well, that's the thing, <laughs> and isn't then it? Leela in the face of evil. Well, well, that's the thing. You know, I'm it... sick of being hip... hypnotized left, right, I'm and sick center. Sick of bug-eyed monsters hypnotized left, right, and center. Yeah. I'm going to pack my goodies and I'm going home. (laughs) It's a running joke that Sarah Jane was always getting hypnotised and she's just sick of it. I like that. Also, there's a joke in Brain of Morbius where the Doctor says, you thought I was dead, Sarah. You always always think that, don't you? Yeah. I wonder if the um, if the location footage still exists for this. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so too. Something tells me that the um, people behind the collection team are going to be real teasers and probably release this out of the Tom Baker years, probably the last. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think we're probably going to get... Something tells me they're going to... All of Graham Williams' era... Probably yeah. seasons fifteen to seventeen, and then this last. Because if you look at the DVD range, his final story to be released was Terror of the Zygons, which was which is considered a classic. Yeah, they took ages to get Terror of the Zygons out, didn't they? I'm I'm really not sure why they took so long to get that yeah, one out. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why. Because um, you know, the rest. It's not like it's a missing episode yeah. or has to be recolored, but. Uh... And even like maybe they just liked teasing us. I mean, the DVD itself is great, but for for um mm-hmm. for the length of time it took to get it out, the the extras on it are a bit. They're good, but they're 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 not. Mm-hmm. I thought there'd be more considering how long it took for that one to actually get released. Well, yeah, it had the Unit Family Part Three documentary on it, mm. which um. I don't know. I don't know when that was recorded. But it looked like it was recorded like two thousand and five, two thousand and six, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And the DVD came out two thousand and thirteen. <laughs> it was really weird. Because uh, I remember the DVD came out. It they released it early in the fourth Doctor time capsule, didn't they? That was a thing that they did. Oh, oh I hated that. And <laughs> then they re- and um, I think earlier in the year they released. Uh, 10th planet with the animated episode 4 alongside the re- alongside all the regeneration stories and I'm like I already own all these and you're yeah. asking me to buy them again so I can just experience the 10th <laughs> planet you uh, <laughs> and it was like they, they knew what they were doing because um, I, I'm not sure about the 4th Doctor time capsule but the I have the regeneration set and the version of the 10th planet in that doesn't have any special features so they knew what they were doing with that. Yeah, they were just true. like y- y- If you want to get the special features, buy the actual DVD. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, um, Sarah Jane just gave a year there. She said, I'm really from 1980. Oh, oh that opens a whole can of worms. Yeah, there's more. That's Actually, one more for the dating controversy. <laughs> 
actually, in fairness, I think the unit, the whole unit dating thing, I think it's pretty consistent up until Mordrin Undead when they completely fuck it over. Yes. Because then they say the Brigadier retired in, what, 1976, 77, something like that? Something oh. like that. It's, uh... Oh, God. <laughs> Makes no sense. Yeah. Now, this actor's been in Doctor Who before, hasn't he? I definitely recognise him. Yeah, he was in... He was in The Ark, Mind of Evil, this. Yep. He was in um, The Invisible Enemy, Castrovalva, and Remembrance of the Daleks. Oh, it's Remembrance. And I know he was I um, him I... from. Yeah. Yeah, because he played. I I don't know the um, character's name, but he was the head teacher in Grange Hill, which I've never seen. That's <laughs> I've heard it. It's a really popular TV show. Yeah, I've never seen. And it also, either, he but... was. Um, yeah. He was also Admiral Ozzel in The Empire Strikes Back. There, that's it. Nah, it's all coming back to me now. He's the one who, <laughs> yeah, he doesn't take. Um, he's the one who doesn't take Darth Vader seriously and gets choked through gets the TV. Choked, yeah, that's it. It's all coming back to me now. Yeah, I definitely recognise him from Remembrance, and I was thinking, is that yeah? <laughs> The one thing I don't get is that Marcus and Lawrence are supposed to be brothers, but Lawrence look no sorry, Marcus looks at least thirty years older than than Lawrence. Yes, there was quite a gap. He looks seems. like his He looks like his dad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean and there's um, quite a few times where Mar where Lawrence says, Oh, we we found this place when we were boys, so they're they're not too the age gap is not too much. But you could argue that maybe his aged appearance is because of Sutek possessing him. Yeah, that's true. But even then, he look, he did look quite... Uh, <laughs> quite yep. old in the uh, little prologue. Hmm. Now, of course, if um, the prologue, if that was the new series, it would be the pre-credits. Yes, yeah. So yeah, I think uh, Michael Sheard is the, is um, is the guy's name. Yeah, it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's on the commentary for this, isn't he? I'm pretty he sure. is. Yeah, yeah, which is a shame because I think he died. A, he died a year later in two thousand five. Yeah, yeah. And Bernard Archer, who plays um, Marcus, was um, in Power of the Daleks as well. Yes, he was. Um, and if you watch the uh, animation of that, uh, occasionally I'll, I'll be watching it. I was thinking, wait, is that Marcus Scarman? Oh, wait, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon the uh, time tunnel we see there, that'll definitely be on the uh, season 13 cover art. Absolutely. that's released. Absolutely, yeah. It looks really, really cool, actually. Heck, I, I mean, yeah. I think we'll probably get... I don't think we'll probably get another box set released until next year, because if they were aiming for a Christmas release, they would have announced it by now. Yeah, I it'll be next year, I reckon, early next year. Um, thankfully, they are back in production now, which is nice. But uh, They are, yeah. Which is nice. I'm enjoying seeing a lot of the updates. Because um, I bet they've got to uh, shoot a trailer as well, which is probably when they've got all the production stuff in the can. Very true, yeah. And I mean, even with that, um, and 
you know this this isn't me being funny or anything but a lot of the people who would uh who would be in those trailers would kind of be placed in the high risk category for covid wouldn't they because obviously a lot of them are quite uh old now that's true so yeah. i think they'd have to be really careful well, when shooting those trailers well now apparently it's people in their early 20s i don't know well who knows <laughs> who knows <laughs> That cliffhanger was pretty cool. Yeah, it's a cool cliffhanger, him yeah. Burning, um, Marcus burning him, yeah. It was a cool effect as well earlier. Yeah, Philip Hinchcliffe knew... It was, yeah. Philip Hinchcliffe knew how to make cliffhangers. He knew how to get his audience back the following week. Oh, yeah. Hands down. It's... Uh... Interesting. Peter Grimwade was, the, uh, was one of the production assistants on this one. Yeah, and um, I mean, in um, Robots of Death, Grimwade Syndrome is named after. <laughs> they call it Grimwade Syndrome. And Paddy Russell, I do know she was the first woman director for Doctor Who because she directed The Massacre in 1966 and then didn't come back until Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Yeah, very true, very true. Um, and. Uh... She's a great director. Um, she's quoted, yeah, she's quoted for saying to Barry Letts, apparently, I'll come back and do another Doctor Who as long as I don't have to direct any tin cans. <laughs> Obviously referring to the Dark. Yeah. So we've uh, we've just seen that this is another story with a uh, with a uh, pseudonym writer. Yes, yeah, Stephen Harris. Stephen Harris. Um, yeah, the idea came from Lewis Griefer. Yeah. But he was, he was finding, it. yeah, because in his original script, I think the Brigadier was going to be involved in this. Hmm. Yeah. So, but um, obviously, Philip Inchke wants to move away from that, so it was rewritten significantly. I mean, do you count this as a Bob Holmes script? Uh, it's quite hard to say. Yeah, really. it's difficult to say. I, mm. I really want to grab the. Uh, I don't know how much it would go for, but I really want to grab the Pyramids of Mars figure set that they released a few years back. Yeah, does that come with Sutek and a mummy? Uh, it's Sutek a mummy, and I think Scarman. I think. Oh, nice! And it comes with the um, it comes with the sarcophagus as well. You can take the door off, and it has the time tunnel. Um, so yeah, I really want to get. And that. also, can you um, can you switch Sutek's eyes green? Yeah, it has a little light up thing on the back of his head, which is cool. Mm-hmm. I do have a figure of the mummy separately, though, um, and they look really cool as figures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gabriel Wolf, who voiced um, who voices Sutek, I'm so glad they got him back for the new series to do uh, the Beast because his voice is so scary. It really is. He's a masterful voice actor. Mm-hmm. He he's so good. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a great little touch to bring him back for uh, for the Impossible Planet. Uh, really nice little touch. Heck, I'm surprised they didn't just say the villain was Sutek in that two parter. <laughs> well, it's kind of it's it's kind of implied, isn't it? You can kind of it's one of those things where you can kind of think. At so. the end of this story. Yeah, the end of this story, they the Doctor sends him to like the furthest reaches of time. Yeah. What if he sent him to before time, where he was imprisoned in the pit and assumed a devil-like form? Exactly, yeah. It's one of those things where you can think that they're the same character if you want to, I think. that it, There's enough information mm-hmm. there um, to leave it open. Yeah, and even then, that story does say, I'm the devil in... All religious and incarnations. So yes, exactly. Just take your pick. Yeah. 
Wait, what did he throw in there? The TARDIS key? Um, yes, I think so. Uh, it's a little unclear. But, yeah. Now, the inclusion of the poacher that we're seeing here, I like how he has nothing to do with the story, but it's basically um, how how the mummies and Sutex influence infects the everyman. Yes, yeah. You realise what will happen to innocent people if Sutek isn't stopped. Yeah, it's a nice little uh it's a nice little in- inclusion that I think a lot of uh a lot of people wouldn't mm-hmm. include and I think it's nice that they did include this little uh this little small little character. Cause I remember cause I remember an interview from Russell T Davis he said um one of my favorite Doctor Who moments ever is in The Stones of Blood where the ogre look for obviously more blood and they come across two campers we've never Mm. seen them before we don't know their names and we never see them again but it's a two minute scene that shows what happens if the doctor does not stop them and it's so vital yes the story i think yeah for sure it's really cool Yeah, the guy who plays him, George Tovey, was he related to Roberta Tovey? Was in any um, way? He might have been. I'll look that up actually. Yeah, look at that. Um, yeah. Yeah, Roberta Tovey played uh, Susan in the Peter Cushing films. Yes, yeah. I don't know. Christopher Barry did actually uh, want um, Peter Cushing to play Solon in a. Uh, Brain of Morbius now, that would have been cool. Yeah, that <laughs> would have been. Especially with yeah. the whole um, Doctors before William Hartnell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she is the daughter of the actor George Tovey. Oh, that's cool. That's quite cool. Yeah. Now this story, it's, believe it or not, only the second time we see the fourth Doctor inside the TARDIS because the first time we see him is in Planet of Evil because in season 12 we never see him inside it. Yeah, the the fourth Doctor's era has a weird little... Certainly the, the early part of his era has a, a weird little relationship with the TARDIS because in season 12 we never see it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in a few stories' time, in season 14, we will get a... The secondary control room, console room with the with the wooden effect to it. So it's uh, yeah. Which, let's be honest, they should have kept forever and ever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Bernard Archard as Marcus is really good because you can almost tell uh, Marcus is really fighting against Sutex's will, but he can't. Yes. He has to be Sutex's puppet. Yeah, it's a really good performance. And I, I like the little details in the makeup as well, the sort of little red around the eyes. It's 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 so subtle, but it works really well in sort of conveying the yeah. possessed thing. Um, yeah. Yeah.
And yeah, those mummies are so scary because they don't have a face. Yes, <laughs> it's so unpleasant. And and I think they have the potential to be a bit comical if they were shot incorrectly. Um, just because of that giant yeah, chest definitely. and stuff. It they you know if if they were shot incorrectly and if they were shot sort of haphazardly, I think they would have the potential to be quite laughable but because of the way they're shot and because of the mm. way the scenes are, are cut together it, it works really well and they work really well as a, a viable threat mm-hmm. and it's such a unique design as well because you think mummies you sort of think of that stereotypical mummy sort of image um these ones are very unique in how they're shaped mm-hmm. and everything. It's um, it's cool. Yeah. And also an interesting fact about the TARDIS console. It's the last time we see that particular console until the Invisible Enemy, which is two years down the line. Mm. Yeah, that is... It's, wow. it's kind of mad when you think about it. Like, that would never happen today. Like, they'd never go two years without seeing yeah, the like interior. if... Um... Yeah, but like if the eleventh Doctor decided, you know what, I'm gonna have my old console back, yeah. but then realizes in the next season, now nah, I'll go get, I'll go back to the other one. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's because a lot of the time, um, writers would just see the TARDIS as, you know, a form of transport. Yeah, it's a, it's just there to get the Doctor to his destination, whereas. Definitely in the eighties, J and T saw it as a home. Yeah, yeah. Complete, complete with bedrooms and everything. That's the thing. I think in the uh, in the seventies, especially, it was definitely much more of a mode of transportation. It was, it was, it's, it was like the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars in that it was just, it was the space, mm-hmm. it was the spaceship, it was the time machine, as opposed to sort of, like you said, the eighties and especially now when it's it's. Its role is uh, is a lot bigger in the show. Mm-hmm. Now I know in 2014 when Doctor Who magazine did the 50th anniversary poll, this story came, so it still made the top ten. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think if they did the poll now, it probably it probably would still make that top ten because I think. For me, at least, if I count my top five fourth Doctor stories, this probably comes number three. Number one being Talons, number two being Deadly Assassin. Yes, it's a... uh, I think it would still be up there. I mean, you never know with those polls because uh, the last poll had some weird Mm -hmm. placements, so you never know, but uh, I would like to think it would still be in the top ten. Which poll do you mean? The 2014 or 2009 one? Uh, uh, 2014 one. The, the last one that we had. Ah, oh, right, okay. Yeah. Because the 2009 one, when I read that, it made me angry. Yeah. <laughs> very, very angry. <laughs> Every Russell T. Davies finale was above Inferno. Yeah. What planet is this <laughs> fandom on? I mean, that's you are the not thing. going to tell me that the master dancing to "I Can't Decide" and invading the Earth with fucking voodoo child is better than Inferno. <laughs> get out! Just get out! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and in the in the last one as well, it was like um, every. It, it, I think a lot of the time it goes that the newest stories are the highest ones. Like I. I love the Day of the Doctor as much as the next guy, but it's mm-hmm. not the greatest story ever made. Oh no, definitely like, not. Like not by no. a I long think if shot. it was done, if we did a poll now, I'm not even sure if it'd come in the top twenty. I don't yeah. think it would. I, that's the thing. It's just it's all those polls are definitely products of their time, uh, and it's interesting when you look at yeah, them. That the newer sto- ones are often right at the top. Yeah, because Stolen Earth and Journey's End, that was only a year old in the 2009 poll, mm. but six years down the line, it did um, it did drop down a few places. Yeah. And also, I think um, 
Doctor Who being available, classic Doctor Who anyway, being available on home media does have a lot to play in. Because in 2009, we were at what? just over the halfway point for classic who yes and by the time 2014 came around nearly every story had been released including a lot of the seventh doctor era which um definitely came higher probably because all of his era had now been shown on dvd yeah exactly that's the thing there's a lot of sort of uh contextual factors to sort of consider when you look at those polls and uh yeah it's uh take them with a pinch of salt I think. yeah batman march and Batman March and Billy Garrett John they did a video <laughs> yeah. when the magazine came out and that's that's a really good video. Yeah, I love that. It's definitely video. one I agree with. Yeah, I love that video. There's um yeah, I'm trying to think of some of the other like baffling placements as well, but there were so many sort of odd odd uh, placements of uh of stories in that. Yeah, like, the the most baffling for me is Rings of Akaten making it into the top ten worst. What? Yeah, yeah, you're you're quite a defender of Akaten, aren't you? Um, I... I am, yeah. yeah. I, it's personally my favourite story of Series 7. I like it. I, I definitely... I, I, I think it's... I think yeah. just for the world-building aspect, I think it's good. Um... Yeah, mm-hmm. not one of my favourites, but I, I certainly think it's nowhere near bottom 10 worst. Nowhere near. Yeah. I suppose you get upset when you see Love and Monsters still at the bottom because uh... you're an avid defender <laughs> of that story. I am an avid defender of Love and Monsters. Yeah, but to be honest, I'm used to that, though. It's like I, I, I read a poll and I, yeah. I'm... Uh, I read a poll and like I, I'm shocked if it's not in the bottom ten. It's just one of those things. It's um, but you can't you can't tell either because sometimes there are stories that I expect to be mm-hmm. in the bottom ten and then they're way up. So you you just never can tell. In fact, yeah, what was the bottom? This there? scene, I do. Yeah, sorry, go on. <laughs> what what was the bottom? No, I'll just say the the bottom story yeah. ever ever. Yeah, in the last in the twenty fourteen uh, one. For the twenty fourteen one it was Twin Dilemma. Two thousand and nine it was Twin Dilemma. And oh. I think for two thousand and three it was the Twin Dilemma. <laughs> oh, oh I mean yeah. it's 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 terrible. <laughs> oh, but uh yeah. Give it give it a break next time. <laughs> but yeah, sorry, no, you were saying about this mm-hmm. scene. This this uh yeah, this is um, really good because I think um, one of the things Bob Holmes was aware of was that um, historical stories, I think for the audience, would be a turn-off because you'd think, well, we know the world's not going to end in whatever time period we're in, so why should we care? Yeah. And this scene perfectly demonstrates why we should because if we don't stop him, then the world we know in the future will be destroyed. Exactly. Time yeah. time can be rewritten, as the modern series likes to say a lot. I definitely appreciate seeing the TARDIS a lot in this. Mm-hmm. It, do, it it does make yeah. a nice change, as we were talking about earlier, but it just sort of... Yeah, it's it's just nice. <laughs> and this is what I mean about the direction really playing, really playing a big part in how these mummies look. Um, just framing them in like low angles and stuff it just makes them look so powerful and uh real physical threats yeah these mummies yeah they're shot really well so they just don't look comical at all they look genuinely terrifying Mm. yeah and just the way they come lumbering through the through the um, through the forest and stuff, it just looks fantastic. 
Mm-hmm. Also, I noticed the Hinchcliffe era did give us something that, that was very common during the RTD and early Moffat years, which was, uh, of course, not too confidential because it gave us Who's Doctor Who. It did, yes. Who's Doctor Who, which is a really fun that is so... documentary. It's... It is really good, yeah, because it is it is pretty much a confidential episode because <laughs> in Doctor Who Confidential, they'd obviously talk about the making of the latest episode, but also um, like other influences on the story and um, uh, how the Doctor has been an influential character. Because I remember in episode four for Aliens of London, um, obviously they talked about the making of it, but they also talked about... Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the role of the companion in the classic series as well. Yeah, I, I, as a kid, I always got really excited whenever they showed a clip of the classic series in, um, in a confidential mm-hmm. episode. Um, like it was just like, oh, this is cool! Like watching a clip of of an old story. It was just a really exciting thing, and I liked that they did that because it made what could have been a fairly dry behind the scenes thing into a real sort of comprehensive mm-hmm. look at a story I, I i really miss confidential i do yeah it's nice that we get those little behind the scenes yeah. things online but it's just yeah I, I just miss confidential it's just not the same as a 45 minute making yeah off. me neither yeah it's not the same mm-hmm. And also, um, like uh, the beasts from the Impossible Planet, um, they're both imprisoned. Yes. They aren't destroyed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's another similarity. Yeah. They're they're very very similar. It's. Uh... Heck, um, the Impossible Planet and the Satan Pit. It's kind of a mix of this story and uh, Robots of Death because you've got the servants. Of mm. humans going berserk and attacking them, yeah, absolutely. and they both have red eyes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Absolutely, yeah. It's um, I Impossible Planet feels like one of the the more classic feeling stories of the new series to me. It uh, definitely feels like it. And also, it's filmed in a quarry. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> I, when I, I I was they use an alien. They use a quarry for an alien planet. Yeah, that's true. I I always look at that story and I always think that it it could be a seventy story or a, or a sixty story, um, mm-hmm. in terms of just the concept and everything. Well, I think um, I mean I also think stories like Mummy on the Orient Express, if you and Tooth and Claw, if you extended them by another forty five minutes, um, replaced the TARDIS scene with the Fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane, mm. it'd fit perfectly into this era. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I also that another one um, like that is I remember the thinking this when it aired um, the Ghost Monument feels like something like Enlightenment, like it feels like a Davison four parter to me. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I think I mentioned that in my review because when I first watched, it, I thought, "Hey, this is like Enlightenment." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember when it aired, just thinking, "This just feels like an eighties four parter. It just feels like it, it's of that era." Yeah, hence why I totally stand by uh, my statement that the Chibnall era is the most, like, classic Who that we've had in this series. Oh, no. Yeah, no, hands down. It absolutely is. Yeah. It absolutely is. Hello to all the... um... (laughs) Hello to all the people who are still watching and haven't left their computers in disgust (laughs) as I dared compare classic Who to the awfulness that is the Chibnall era, (laughs) but as soon as he leaves, you're going to say the next guy or woman is going to be and is the awful era. (laughs) I I see so many people who like the Chibnall era, like me, and think, I don't get all the hate it's getting. And me, who had to live through the Moffat era getting so much hate when I was one of the few who liked it, I'm just sat there thinking, first time, eh? That's the thing, (laughs) isn't it? I mean, because I think you just sort of, as I've got older, I've certainly uh, 
I've mellowed out on my because th- I'm not really a fan of the later part of the Moffat era, but I've definitely mellowed out, and it's not like I'm not yeah. like one of those people that are, are like constantly every time a new bit of uh, of news comes out, I'm just I'm not like oh it shows a shadow of what it once was. Roger Delgado would be spinning in his grave. John Pertwee would be spinning in his grave, and it's just. <laughs> Oh, come on! <laughs> Every year, yeah, I'm not making a six. I'm not making a six-hour live stream every time the the lead actor breathes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just every you know eras are to different people's tastes, mm-hmm. and that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love the Doctor's... I love how angry the Doctor gets here. Yes, it's brilliant. He's like, this is one life against... This is one life against billions that Sutek is going to kill. I, I love the way I love the way he says uh, cadaver there as well. Animated human cadaver! Mm-hmm. <laughs> Stay here! Stay here! <laughs> The Sutek costume is great because it looks like an actual sarcophagus. Yeah. Just worn by a man. Yeah, it's a really brilliant. I think Gabriel design. Wolf was in. Yeah, because I think Gabriel Wolf is inside the costume as well. Um. Yeah, I think so. I assume he was. Yeah. I think he might have done his lines live as well. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> Right, one thing I noticed is the Doctor, when he left the hut, he wasn't wearing his hat, now he's got it on. That's a good point. That's a very good point. (laughs) Minus one out of ten pyramids of Mars. Hashtag not my Doctor. I think think there might be a deleted scene where he comes back in the hut and says, forgot my hat. Yeah. That's it. I know you can get another figure set as well, which has the, like a really like cool 3D diorama of the giant uh, pyramid, ah, which is cool. cool. And you like and it like well, constructs together and stuff. Well, speaking of figures, I know um, Australia have announced a um, 12 Doctor and Davros figure. Yes, yes, they have. Yeah. Um, which is interesting that, that that started appearing in Australian stores, isn't it? It's uh... yeah, because I thought, cause I thought, oh, is it part of like the history of the Daleks set yeah. that the Anem have been giving us? Because I thought we've gotten what from Daleks Master Plan to Magicians Apprentice? <laughs> That's quite a stretch. I I I I definitely think I'll pick that up though, because I don't have a Twelfth Doctor in like the hoodie, and I don't have a modern series Davros. I've only got. Uh, an 80s Davros, so I'll definitely pick that up if we get it over here. I do have a modern Davros because it was um, part of the Stolen Earth set that was released in 2008. It was, yeah, and uh, that was one of the the sets I really wanted as a kid, but I never got. So it's always been quite a long, uh, large gap in my collection. Mm-hmm. Look, his hat's on the chair. Yeah. I think when he's outside, but he's got his hat on. <laughs> That's very true, yeah. Oh, God. You just know if that would happen now that you'd get all the people who hate the Chimnal era going, oh, it's such a cheaply put yeah. together production. <laughs> This is proof that Chibnall does not care about his vision of Doctor Who. It's like when The Last Jedi came out and uh, people were getting Uh really pissy because there was a continuity error in one of the fight scenes. And like... (laughs) Yeah, and when they said... um, And when they said, you can't drop bombs in space, (laughs) 
Yeah, you can't. But guess fucking what? It's fantasy. Yep. You take liberties. It's it's. You also there's no sound in space. But guess <laughs> what? I can hear all the fucking space battles. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. It's fantasy and also Ugh. weren't there bombers in The Empire Strikes Back, which everyone loves so much. Exactly. <laughs> uh... I've said it before, I've said it million time, millions of times before, if The Empire Strikes Back came out today, it would be just as hated as The Last Jedi. I think it was when it came out, exactly. because a lot of people thought there was no beginning and there was no end, it just... There's no beginning and no end. It just felt like the middle. That's because, well, it was the middle. Exactly, and especially if you watch it back to back with um with uh, the first film, it is such a tonal shift. It's such a massively like yeah. almost jarring tonal shift, and that's exactly what people complained about yeah. with the Force Awakens and the Last Jedi. But there we yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, one of the worst criticisms I heard against the Last Jedi is. It was bad because Admiral Akbar should have been the one kamikazing the Star Destroyers oh, because God. he's an established character. God. No, he's not. He's <sighs> a meme. And I don't. <laughs> and if anyone's going to comment and say, yeah, but in volume 47 of the Admiral <laughs> Akbar Chronicles, he. No, <sighs> I don't care. He has two minutes of screen time in Return of the Jedi. And yes, I love the line, it's a trap. But he's not a character. Fuck off. He's not a character. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. He's he's just a meme. He's he's not a character. He's became he became a character because the line "It's a trap" is memorable, and people have attributed character characteristics to him over the years. He's the only reason mm-hmm. he's popular is because of the legacy and the uh, the yeah, remember... iconography of that line, and and you know he's not really a character. Yeah, I saw a review that took a line from... Uh, it was a conversation between Ryan Johnson and Mark Hamill. And Mark Hamill did say, you know, I just didn't feel this was right for um, Luke Skywalker's character, and I didn't think it would be right for the fans. But Ryan Johnson said, yeah, I, I did get your grievances, Mark, but I think we also had... But I wanted to tell a story. And then the reviewer just goes, oh, fuck you, Ryan Johnson. Oh. Like, oh, sure. That's the thing, isn't it? He tells this. He tells this story how he wants, and fair enough if you don't want to like it. But no need to say "fuck you," you ruined my childhood. Exactly, yeah. and that's the thing, isn't it? Mark Hamill disagreed in the early stages of the production of the Last Jedi, and that's fine. That happens on productions. Creative people disagree with each other. But if Mark, you know, if Mark Hamill yeah. had this beef against Ryan Johnson, Mark Hamill's a very vocal guy. He would be saying so. He is, yeah. He would be absolutely saying so. I mean, Harrison Ford thought that um, um, Han Solo should have been killed in Empire Strikes Back or something, so I guess Irvin Kershner can piss off too, right? <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? That's the thing. It's And, that, you know, like, I've said before, Last Jedi is one of my favourite Star Wars films. I love it. But I know a lot of people and a lot of my close friends don't like it, and that's fine. That's absolutely fine. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not gonna like go after people for not liking it. So yeah. please don't go after me for saying that I do like it. <laughs> if you like it, concentrate on actual criticism. You know, stuff that happens, yeah. and not saying it's a vehicle for Kathleen Kennedy's toxic femininity or whatever the hell you want to run about yeah. with that because you suddenly see women and ethnic people in star wars i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna end this conversation about star I was gonna wars say yeah this line you took you turned star wars against me <laughs> you have done that yourself you will not take it from me <laughs> hello and welcome to the oh, star yeah, wars I remember... <laughs> One more thing. I remember a year ago, there was like that tweet saying, we're going to petition to remake The Last Jedi. It's like <laughs> yeah. Anakin from Revenge of the Sith. I have brought peace, freedom, justice, and security to my new cut of The Last Jedi. <laughs> Your new cut. <laughs> You're going to remake The Last Jedi. You're going to remake a millions of dollar motion picture without any access to the stars, <laughs> to uh, to the official IP. Mm-hmm. I just... Oh. 
Stupidity. Absolute yeah. stupidity. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, well. <laughs> now, Sarah just handed the doctor gelentine, is that what it's called? Uh, yes. Something that's very highly unstable. Now, I know in um, Seeds of Doom there was a bit of criticism that, um, because when they're trapped in the cottage, Scorby makes a firebomb to throw at the crinoid, (laughs) and um, there were some concerns that people could copy that and actually start making firebombs. (laughs) I'd say that's probably a point. (laughs) It's a a, uh, concern, but then again, you know, where do you draw the line? There was that whole... Wasn't there that whole thing on the Great British Bake Off where uh, one of them hid in a fridge or something and there were loads of complaints because they thought people were going to start hid- hiding in fridges? Well, Indiana Jones did it. Well, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> Now, I just realised, um, yeah, this is, after this point, all the supporting characters are technically dead, because Marcus is literally a puppet of Sutek. Very, very, very true, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh... Yeah. It's quite grim when you think about it, but, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something tells me that I think they might have put, um, a bit more makeup on, on... Bernard Archard's face because he looks really pale. Yeah. And obviously there's red on his eyes. Yeah, and it kind of it kind of seems to get a bit more intense as it goes along as well. One thing that did surprise me about the Hinchcliffe era is that um, now obviously we had Revenge of the Cybermen, but I'm surprised he didn't use the Cybermen. He didn't reinvent the Cybermen like he did the Master, because the Master in the Deadly Assassin is a mutated, horrible figure. And, you know, they could have had a Cyberman story that really goes into the body horror of conversion. Yeah, very true. Almost like Frankenstein. Very true, and I uh, I think the... I think the Hinchcliffe era could have had a field day with that kind of stuff, but it just never really happened. Mm-hmm. I just don't think uh, they were that invested in um, doing old monsters again, like Daleks and Cybermen, which is fair enough. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely fair enough, yeah. Though, again, if Chibnall... Actually, well, if Chibnall did dare to do that for <laughs> Series 11, <laughs> there'd be a fit. Actually, one of the stupidest comments I saw, this was in, this was after State aired, they said, the first season of Peter Capaldi was disappointing because it lacked Daleks and Cybermen. Oh, for fuck's sake. Well, you clearly didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> scream how he's just sat there yeah it reminds me of um is uh i think you've not seen the man with the golden gun have you no I haven't. yeah there's a bit in that where um a character dies and she's just sat there sort of looking forward and and bond sits down next to her and starts talking and he just sort of slowly realises that she's not speaking back and she's just staring forward and then the camera pans down to her chest 
and uh, we realise what's happened. It's quite a small cast when you think about it, isn't it? Yeah, but you really do... Um, yeah, I do like that because you get to know them more and you do care for them, definitely. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Where did... Hmm, one, thing, one thing that I'm not sure he's ever explained is where did they get all the materials to build a missile? <laughs> It's only 1911. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they got it from... Oh, well. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, uh, well, I buy it. I assume this coming up when Tom Baker is in the mummy costume, I assume that's not actually him, is it? I don't think so, no. no I would I would think he would have... I love, I love Sarah's line. Another gripe I do have. Wouldn't Sutek know that that mummy's not under his influence? Yeah. <laughs> or is it only Mark? Or is it only Marcus he's controlling? But ah oh, well. I feel like he probably would know though. Like he would have some knowledge of that. But yeah. oh well, you just gotta go with it. Somewhere in an alternate universe, he's got two titles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. I mean, they look like Doctor Who titles. It's, it's. Mm -hmm. I assume they were made with the same technique, right? Probably. I yeah. would think so. Though in season ten, we could have gotten a new uh, theme, the Delaware theme. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the uh, the good old weird. Out of place Delaware theme. That <laughs> <laughs> I always think of that. It's um, that's one of those things that, with a bit more to it, I think it could sound really cool. Like add a bit more layers to it, but as it is, it just is a bit bare bones. Yeah, the problem I have with that theme is that it. It more sounds like a parody of the Doctor Who yeah. theme <laughs> than the actual theme, but uh, oh well, they tried. <laughs> yeah, I love how great Sarah is in this. She gets to be resourceful like this, but also there's moments earlier when um, she says to the Doctor, sometimes you don't seem human because of how, um, not callous, but just... Um, how he doesn't have a reaction to people dying because he, he he knows that it's the first of billions if Sutek isn't stopped. Yeah, yeah. It's um she she's Sarah Jane was the perfect audience surrogate. Absolutely. And I think she she's just this story encapsulates why people love the character so much. Mm-hmm, definitely, yeah. And also, um, when she appeared in The Five Doctors, one thing that I've not seen a lot of people bring up is that The Five Doctors more or less confirmed that K-9 and company is canon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I definitely consider it canon. Um, it's... Cause... Yeah, I do. Because yeah. <laughs> also it's referenced again in the, new se in the new series when Sarah Jane has K-9. Yeah, yeah. And I think that... I think that led to a bit of a misconception that they appeared in the main series together, but no, they didn't. K-9 came after Sarah Jane left. Exactly, yeah, but the character is so kind of... K-9 is so synonymous with her mm -hmm. that it's, uh, it's, yeah. That's true, yeah. I mean, Leela has her, has her own version of K-9, yeah. whereas um, 
Leela K9 Leela K9 and company <laughs> set on Gallifrey <laughs> You know, if Leela was on Gallifrey when the Time War broke out, does that mean she's dead? Well, that's the whole thing, isn't it? There's so many, there's so many <laughs> questions. Uh, it's like, is is yeah. is this character alive? Is that character alive? Um... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that Sutek is holding in the explosion. That's that's a really clever bit of storytelling. Yeah. I always panic when she... It just shows how powerful he Absolutely. is. Absolutely. I always panic when she shoots the thing, though, because I always think my uh, my DVD freezes. I always think, <laughs> yeah. oh, 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 no, okay. It's <laughs> well, for years, funnily enough, on Spider-Man 2, I thought there was something wrong with my DVD because, um, you know, the raindrops on Targe. You know, it's the nothing's worrying. Oh. Peter freezes, and then it goes on to me. <laughs> For years, I thought, is there something wrong with my DVD? Yeah. It's only when I saw it on TV quite a few years later that I realised, oh, it's part of the film. Especially because it fades out <laughs> after that as well. I think a lot of people kind of uh, kind of used to think that it was uh, that, w- that it was a problem with the uh, the DVD. It's uh, yeah. Mhm. The thing is, you get you get some DVDs that have a uh, two layers, and uh, the film or the show stops uh, for like a, a second when the layers change. Mhm. It's funny watching uh, the Tom Baker is VHS Part One, which is obviously the Hinchcliffe years, and um, he's more or less reacting to every clip and being like. Oh yes, I remember that one. That was wonderful. One of the best I've ever done. Then we get to Graham Williams, and he's like, "I don't remember that one. Must have been the one where we uh, must have been close to the one where we went to Paris." <laughs> oh, I went to Paris with with my wife or some shit. So uh, let's try another one. <laughs> I remember reading um David Williams's autobiography, and when um he and Matt Lucas approached him to narrate Little Britain. Apparently he said, um, the thing about television is I don't watch it anymore because I just look at it and go, oh, he's dead, she's dead, I fucked her and she's dead. <laughs> I just love how Tom is 86 and still going. Oh yeah, for sure. I, uh, I really hope he did all right. If I ever meet him, I just want to... If I ever meet him, I just want to say, um, to quote yesterday when the guy meets John Lennon, where he says, he made it to 79, that's amazing. Yes. I just want to say to him, he made it to 80-whatever, <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, I hope he did all right during uh, probably say to be... lockdown. Well, he lives in um, quite a big house in yeah. an isolated area, so I, th- I think it was all yeah. right. Because I've seen... Talons of Wang Chiang, the documentary that was filmed at his house. <laughs> yeah. I think also he had a picture of... I remember watching that documentary, I think he had a picture of David Tennant. <laughs> <laughs> Which, interestingly enough, I think he said about the new series, this was quite a few years ago, he said... I've never really watched the new series because I just can't be bothered with it. <laughs> Fair enough. He he had like the most sensible and calm reaction to uh to when Jodie Whittaker was cast as well. He was I th- I think I read he mm-hmm. he was just like oh it might be nice to have a woman but uh, if it doesn't work well you can always kill her off. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like fair enough. <laughs> Heck, wasn't it? Heck, wasn't it Tom Baker who suggested that we could have a female doctor? Because it was, yeah. To be famed for saying um, when he was leaving, you know, I wish my successor all the best of luck, whoever he or she may be. Yes, and it, there's that thing where he was going, oh, it, I don't know who's after me. It might be a woman, and like it's yeah. And it's interesting when Peter Davison left. Um, the interview for that, um, the news reporter does ask a JNT, what's all this news in the papers that you're looking for a female Doctor Who? Let's have the truth. 
and I think JNT said, um, now it is perfectly reasonable that the Doctor could regenerate into a woman, but I, but it's not something I'm considering. Yes, uh, for yeah. the Sixth Doctor. <laughs> oh, I really wish we had a female Doctor sooner. Yeah. I'm glad we've got one now, but I really wish we had one in like I remember... the classic series, just so we'd avoid all this nonsense of oh, it tramples all over continuity. I just yeah. <laughs> I remember Diamanda Hagen when the first female Doctor was announced. She just said, "Well, I hope she's written well, but it should have happened years ago." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I really wish it happened years ago. Ah, this is brilliant. Oh yeah. The Doctor's just um. It's probably the fourth Doctor. I think it is most vulnerable. Yeah. Because usually he's. He's a very confident incarnation, quite like the third Doctor, but um, this is probably one of those few times where he's just completely under the submission of a villain. Exactly, yeah. This is one of the best scenes of the fourth Doctor's entire era, and uh, it's just... Yeah. it's. I mean, I mean, most people have, have, have talked about how this is, uh, this is such a great scene before, but this is just... Tom's performance, he just sounds so in pain, and uh, just the way it's done as well, it's just yeah. its really kind of shocking to see this larger-than-life character just be brought, brought down to such a level. It's uh, really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if this was season 17, the, the Doctor would be saying, if you're supposed to be the most evil creature in the universe, why don't you get off that seat? Bye-bye! <laughs> <laughs> In fact, one thing I found quite interesting, one thing I read recently, it was from a um, blogger called Doco, Docoho, I think that's his oh, name. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, he made quite an interesting, and that, he does written reviews, he yeah. made quite an interesting analysis of the Hinchcliffe and Graham Williams era. He said, when I went to revisit the Hinchcliffe era, I wasn't really surprised because... You know, I expected a lot of these stories to still hold up, and they did. Yes. But with the Graham Williams here, I expect I expected all of them to be not very good and quite trite. But I surprised myself a lot with how fun and imaginative they were. Well, that's the thing that the Tom Baker yeah. era goes through so many extremes from, uh, and it's because it spans so many years. It just goes through so much that it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, season 12 to 14, it's the gothic horror. Season 15 to 17, it's very much comedy, but also a sense of adventure, particularly with season 16 and the key to time. Yeah, yeah. And season 18, it's kind of a um, a mishmash of all those eras, because State of Decay is gothic horror. Um, Full Circle and State of Decay and Warriors Gate, it's very much an a que- an interconnected adventure because they're trying to escape e-space. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. And see, and Leisure Hive and Megloss feel very much like season 17 um, stories. Yeah, they, they very much do, yeah. Uh, especially Megloss. Especially Megloss. Mm-hmm. This is, I would say, another one of those stories that's perfect for Halloween. <laughs> Definitely, uh, just tweeted that. <laughs> yes, I saw them. I it came up on my notifications. Yeah, um, yeah. It just, mm-hmm. and especially because of the homage to the mummy and everything, it just, uh, it really works well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I imagine this commentary will go up just before Halloween. So, uh, yeah. There's a Halloween treat for yes, you. Yes, this is the Halloween special of our commentaries. <laughs> Heck, I'd argue every story of season 13, apart from probably Android Invasion, all of them you could watch on Halloween. Yeah, I mean... There may be Ter- Terror of the Zygons. I'm quite inclined to maybe take that off, but it could work. I mean, I, th- I, I think Android Invasion you could as well, because that feels like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, it's only when you get into sort of yeah the deserted village. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Ah, interesting about that TARDIS key. That design comes up again, I think, in um, the TV movie. Yeah, I um, it's a really cool design. I mean, I saw a few years ago. I can't remember who it was, um, but there was someone in the in the in the fandom um, had bought like a little necklace um, of that TARDIS key, and mm-hmm. uh, she she bought it from a from a convention, and it looked really cool. And like, um, yeah, I can't remember who that was now. But yeah, it, it's a really it's probably my favorite design of the of the TARDIS key. Yeah. And also, um, you know, you know, I wonder, is this, um, it's one of those rare times, I think, where the Doctor is actually possessed. The only other instance I can think of is in, um, Midnight, when the creature takes over him. Yep. And, um, briefly in, uh, uh, 42. Oh, yeah. And Nightmare in Silver, when he's taken over by the Cyber Planet. Yeah. And, uh, when he... In, in uh, Cassandra and New Earth. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't count. <laughs> I refuse to believe that Cassandra is as powerful as Suit. <laughs> Get out. It's still baffling to me that for a Doctor's first proper story, they have him possessed for <laughs> for a lot of it. I really don't know why they made that decision. <laughs> Yeah, because in Christmas Invasion, he's asleep for two-thirds of it. Then in New Earth, he's possessed, he's possessed by yeah. Cassandra. That is just so I weird. I mean, fair play, ten... Heck, at least in the Sixth Doctor era, he was only insane for, like, what, uh, the whole serial? That was it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, fair play, Tennant does go for it, and he does... He's clearly having a yeah. lot of fun when he's, like, dancing around and as Cassandra and stuff. So fair play on that level, but, yeah, I do not do not understand why they made that decision. Mm-hmm. It kind of adds to my um thing I've said before. I actually... Now I know Tom... Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think Tom Baker said um, his two favourite stories from his era were The Ark in Space and The Talons of Wing Chiang. And I definitely can see why with Talons because he was working with... Um, uh, what they called Christopher Benjamin and Trevor Baxter. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he said he had so much fun working with those two. I. <laughs> you can definitely tell on screen. I imagine he did. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ark in Space is always one I've struggled a bit with. Like I like it, but it's it's when I think of great Tom <gasps> Baker stories, that never really enters into my brain. It is good. Don't get me wrong, <gasps> but it just never really. Blast me. <laughs> yeah, I know that's the thing, right? Like everyone raves about it, and I do like it. It's just, yeah. I whenever I think of like, oh, great Tom Baker stories, I think of this uh, Pyramids of Mars. I think of Talons. I think of Deadly Assassin, Terror of the Zygons. That one never just enters into my brain for me, and I don't know why. Yeah, I think. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I think Ark. Um... Definitely comes in my top ten fourth Doctor stories. Yeah, fair enough. Because I think I'd take it over stories like Robots of Death and City of Death. I mean, I still oh, love really? those stories. Yeah, but wow. yeah. I I know Ark in Space is RTD and Moffat's favorite story. It is, they yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what Chibnall's favorite story is from the classic era. Hmm. That's. That's a good point. Actually, he's never really said that, has he? He's he's not he he. No, maybe it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> he hasn't been very uh, uh, well. Yeah, aside from his appearance on that show when he was younger, he's never been very vocal about what his uh, opinions are on certain yeah. things. I, I think I get the impression that Chibnall is um quite a sort of shy guy and kind of a reserved guy. Like he never really. Uh, yeah, because I don't really right see him give that many interviews about the Doctor Who, which is, which is perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. You know, they don't owe us anything. And if you're one of those people who say, ah, oh, they should commit to interviews and conventions because uh, they need to serve the fans, just like, fuck yeah. off, no, you don't own them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's like, it reminds me of a, a Julie Kavner. Um, on the Simpsons, like she never, mm-hmm. she she's she's barely ever at like events with the cast and stuff. She she doesn't. I know she refuses to do the Marge voice in public. Uh, 
and it's like oh, yeah, that's yeah. Perfect. fair enough. And also, you know, she's entitled to to do what she wants. Yeah, I know Eccleston. I know he. Um, I know some morons were saying, "Oh, why doesn't he do conventions? He's the doctor. He has a duty to do them." No, he uh, doesn't. <laughs> Heck, he he actually. I know he does conven. More, he's done more conventions now, but in the past he has said, "I've always wanted to make my living from acting. I've never really wanted to just do it from the convention circuit." Yeah, he. But obviously. Yeah. And I think the reason he's done more conventions now is because in 2018, I'm willing to bet, obviously I don't know if this is true, that he was that the 2018 LFCC was a tryout for him. And because he said so many people came up to me and said, oh, you were my first Doctor, you got me into acting, Doctor Who, etc. He felt really moved by that and obviously wanted to do more, which is why I think he came back for the 2019 convention. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard stories about people meeting him and him just being taken aback by the positivity and everything. And he, before, you know, you hear him talk about conventions before he started doing them. And um, he, 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 he definitely said, I get the impression that he, he didn't, get his words out properly because from the signs of it it's not like he was disrespecting people who do conventions he was just saying that they're not for him he'd prefer to earn his money elsewhere but i think the way he worded it kind of rubbed people up the wrong way and it sounded like he was being quite like turning his nose up at it but i don't think he was at all it's uh yeah i'm just glad that he is doing them now mm-hmm. yeah i just wish the convention was the conventions have put the price down. Yeah. A bit. <laughs> oh yeah, it was like ninety pounds, wasn't it, when that first convention? Yeah, it still was for um, the twenty nineteen. Yeah, one. I think it was uh, Chris Thompson did a did a little audio sketch on his channel, and it was like <laughs> this kid going up to meet Eccleston. Oh, I loved you as the Doctor. I- I've saved up all my pocket money. He's like, don't care if you haven't got the cash, you can bugger off. Next. <laughs> now I just realised this this sequence of them going through all the puzzles um, it's, very, it's very deaf to the Daleks isn't it <laughs> yeah a lot of people do say that this last part is a bit of a letdown uh, and um... I don't I don't think so because um, I think for the final episode it does uh, change up uh, the pacing a bit. Yeah, it's... Because it gives us a new location and a new challenge. It is a nice change of pace. I think it loses a lot of the atmosphere that was built up in the first three parts, but I I can't really see where else it could have gone, really. Uh, it just... Yeah. Yeah. Because this more focuses on the science rather than the horror. Yeah, yeah. And there's no, there's no giant hopscotch board with the doctor going, Stop, don't move. <laughs> Stop, don't move. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the two doctors fake cliffhangers. Do you know where the do you know where they are? Of course, the Hacienda's this way. <laughs> where did you get this from? The the cryons. <laughs> Such peril. Also I'm Yeah, that's yeah, I hate it when they split it up season 22 as four-parters because they weren't written and structured to be like that. Yes. Stop giving them fake cliffhangers. Yeah, it was... Oh, there's the famous yeah, gift. That fame, I love that. That's such a wonderful <laughs> bit of physical comedy from those two. It's such a cool yeah. little bit. Nope. Walking into 2020-like. <laughs> nope. Also, uh, I'm... Oh, I've I've actually seen a meme. Yeah, sorry, go on. Saw a meme today with um, yeah, it said the worst things that Doctor has ever done, and it's the thirteenth Doctor saying, "I'll drop you back in 2020." Oh, <laughs> now that is that terrible. That is terrible. <laughs> yeah. I that's a good. I wonder if the show will acknowledge the the coronavirus at all. Like in real time, will it be an event that it acknowledges? I... 
I hope it does, because it'll piss off those idiots who say, Doctor Who shouldn't touch politics. Well, that's the thing. It never touched politics. It was always in the background. <laughs> now I'm going to watch The Sunmakers, which is about a man, which opens with a man wanting to commit suicide because <laughs> he can't pay his taxes. There's nothing political about that at all. Nothing at all. <laughs> Art should be apolitical, even though it's made by people who have opinions. All media is political. <laughs> Yep, even Paddington Bear and me the Pooh. Literally everything, yep. And I mean that's the thing, I honestly don't think Praxius if if we if series twelve had started a month or two later, I don't think Praxius would have aired. Yeah, I think it would have been quite a sensitive yep. topic. It'd be like um it'd be like making a drama about the the Twin Towers. Obviously, yep. before nine eleven happened, but then it airs a few days after the the attack. It, it just wouldn't feel no, right. No, I, I reckon they wouldn't have aired it. I reckon they would have pulled it from the schedule and put it on the uh, on the DVD and Blu-ray release. It would have, and just put it on there. <laughs> it could have been. Just realised if that actually did, then Praxis could have been another Sharder. Yeah, it could have done. Yeah, <laughs> never to be <laughs> transmitted. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think it would have been like a, a Family Guy situation where the episodes that that didn't air and the episodes that were banned would have just gone straight to DVD and um, just would have premiered on DVD instead. Mhm. Oh yeah, that um, that tube is soundproof. So yeah. Sarah can't hear the doctor saying I can't. Do it. <laughs> That's good. Unless she's a master lip reader. <laughs> I like how the good mummies are wearing gold. Yes, they are fabulous. They look, they look st- stylish as hell. Also, I'm sorry if uh, if you can hear Discord sounds on this commentary. It's nothing to do with the. It's <laughs> nothing to do with the connection or anything. It's just other servers that I'm in are people are putting chats in, and I don't know how to turn the sound off because <laughs> I'm not very good at Discord. Oh, that's good. So uh, yeah, apologies <laughs> for that. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be too <laughs> noticeable. But yeah. Mm-hmm. It looks like a big red grape. <laughs> it does, yeah. I I think the 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 backgrounds as well. There's the the CSO backgrounds. They they can be a bit rough, but I think they're done quite well for what they are. Like they're not distracting, really. That's true, yeah. I think they they could have had the potential to be really distracting. Yeah, they're actually quite good. Yeah. They look natural. It's just... It's not like in Terror of the Autons with a lazily screen rather than building a city. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can see I if, a uh, George... bit of fraying. But... I wonder if George, um, George Lucas looked... I wonder if George Lucas looked at Terror of the Autons and thought... <laughs> uh-huh. That's how we should make. Movies. That's what I got. We don't do. need to build a set. We just need a green screen. <laughs> I actually like to think the spirit of Horus actually opened those doors and granted them an easy access to the TARDIS, so they could stop suiting. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice little. That's a nice thought, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you seen the um, special feature that focuses on the career of Sutek? I have, yes. It's on the DVD. Yeah. It's so funny when he goes to an insect and says, "A beast yourself, <laughs> yeah, crawling insects." 
there's a there's another one like that on the City of Death DVD, and it looks at um, at Scaros. Scaros yeah, yeah, it's it's really cool. Begins. Yep, and there's a hand that just uh, moved on from the chair. There. Yep. <laughs> My extra hand has gone. I think one thing they said in the first episode was that this is supposed to be Unit HQ. Unit took over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, which, I mean, which one? There's the, the set changed, exactly, it changed yeah. every episode, <laughs> so it seemed like they moved to a different building. <laughs> just... As much as I love Sutek as a villain. I don't think he should be one who comes back because I think what makes him so terrifying is that there is so much mystery about him. Yeah, and, yeah. And how evil he is. Yeah, for sure. I don't think he should come back. Um, he's one of those great one-off villains, and I think if he got a second story that wasn't very good, it could, it uh, it would kind of ruin it a bit. It could undermine. Yeah. It. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he's gone to a better place. <laughs> Ew, this is the worst place yet. <laughs> oh my, look at the... Oh my god. <laughs> Ew, erotic cakes. <laughs> I'm so bulgy. My butt sticks out and my... Ah! <laughs> Can you tell us what it's like in there, Sutek? Well, it's like, um... <laughs> did anyone see the series Doctor Who? No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 yes, I mean no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he doesn't cause that fire until he's the fifth yeah. doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Timey, wimey. <laughs> In fact, that, that's... Or, yeah, maybe the fourth... That's the story we're looking at. Maybe one of the first... Yeah, maybe one of the first four doctors was there and they made a conscious effort not to bump yeah. into their future <laughs> self. It was the fifth doctor. I demand... That's a really great atmospheric shot oh, to yeah, end on. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I demand that in the next release of the visitation we digitally edit William Hartnell into the background <laughs> or something. <laughs> ha ha! Hoo -hoo. <laughs> <laughs> Hoo -hoo. He's on fire! Hoo -hoo. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, um, you're right, that is a brilliant shot to end on. It's just, yeah. Yeah, this is... It's easily one of the fourth Doctor's best stories ever, ever. Hands ever. down, yeah. Forty-five years down the line, it'll, st yeah, forty-five years down the line, it still holds up, and I think, um, hopefully, a lot of fans will agree with us. Yeah, and there, there, there isn't that. It it hasn't dated that badly either. There's not really like any terrible effects in there. It just it really holds up, and it's uh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely one I'd recommend to get introduced to this era. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone, that is the end of the commentary to Pyramids of Mars. I hope, I hope, I hope, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, as all, as always, <laughs> go and subscribe to Isaac, and uh, we will be back next week with mm -hmm. the visitation, won't we? Visitation is that what we're doing next time? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm kind of flip flopping between Kinder and the Visitation. Either or, either mm. or are good good choices. 
Um, but yes, either way, we'll be back with a fifth Doctor or story next time. Or we could <laughs> let... Um... Mm-hmm. We shall. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>